How is everybody? Welcome, Kathy, Lori, Anita, Dorcas, John, Carrie Ann. Thanks for joining us tonight. We'll keep letting people in as they join, but I will go ahead and get started. So welcome everyone to Heron Gut Coastal Science Center's September's Learn, Discover, Grow series. My name is Alina Zahowski and I'm an aquatic science educator at Heron Gut Coastal Science Center. Because our time this evening is spent talking about the amazing natural resources that Maine has to offer us, I want to begin our time together with an acknowledgement honoring all indigenous peoples. We wish to acknowledge the spiritual and physical connection the Abenaki and Wabanaki peoples have maintained to the Aki land in Nebi water. Herring Gut Coastal Science Center and our work exists within this Aki land and Nebi water of this unceded territory of the Wabanaki homeland. It is our responsibility to foster relationships and opportunities that strengthen the well being of the indigenous people who carry forward the traditions of their ancestors. We love to offer these virtual events in a collaborative way. Because of this, we ask that everyone make sure they mute their microphones to reduce competing noises and voices. At the end of the presentation, we will have time to ask questions. You can also type questions into the chat box and we will address them at the end. Our plan for tonight is to talk with Tina Wood from Upstream. Tina is a Maine master naturalist, artist, educator, and the founder of Upstream, a nonprofit organization focused on opening up fish passage on the Cabasaconte stream in Gardiner, Maine. She will tell you more about her wonderful organization. And some quick background info, because we're kicking off our watershed series, just a little definition here. A watershed is an area of land that sheds or drains water from rivers and tributaries into a basin, such as a lake or ocean. And without further ado, here is Tina Wood. Hi, thank you for joining us tonight. Um, I'm excited to share um, the beautiful Cobbacy stream um, and the work that we've done in the last seven years. Um, so we're going to start by showing uh, our recent video, Keystone, um, that has really helped our project. Um, the video really um, vitalizes the river and stream and Cobbacy watershed. Um, and more people are asking questions and wanting to know when is this going to happen? When will fish passage come to our waters? Oh, and I just put into chat the link to the video. I'll start it on my computer. I'll, I'll pause it after the intro and ask you all if you can hear the audio. If so, we'll keep playing it. If not, I'll pause mine and you all can click the link in the chat or copy and paste the link into another tab and watch the video there. And then in 11 minutes, we'll come back together to discuss it and move forward with Tina's presentation on Zoom. So clicking the video here. That's an amazing sight to see many thousands of fish in the stream all trying to come upstream. So it's a cause for celebration. Amazing sight to see many thousands of fish in the stream all trying to come upstream. So it's a cause for celebration. Dams are a huge problem for migratory fish species like alewives. It matters that the alewives can have passage to their home waters, their native ancestral home to connect our oceans our streams, rivers, bays, and lakes. The alewife is a keystone species. Oops. 
So is the audio working? If people can put in the chat, if you can hear the audio, can we keep going like this? I know one person is good here. Okay, great. So we'll keep going this way. My name's Tina Wood, and I'm the founder of Upstream. Upstream uh, mission is dedicated to restoring sea run fish passage on Cobbacy Stream. Uh, Gardner is a lovely river city on the Kennebec, and Cobbacy Stream flows in. Cobbacy Stream was the lifeblood of early Gardner. When settlers arrived, they realized the power of the water. Eventually, eight granite dams were built in the mile and a quarter above the Kennebec River. They supplied mill power to paper mills, to all sorts of other small companies. Over the years, all of the mills have moved out, shut down and closed. Right now, in downtown Gardner, there are three dams that date back into the first half of the 19th century. River herring, and we parse that out. We call them collectively blueback herring and alewives river herring. And they're anadromous, like the Pacific salmon, like our own Atlantic salmon. We have we have about a dozen species here in Maine that are anadromous. And what that means is is they're principally an oceanic fish, but they are obligate freshwater spawners. They must return to freshwater to spawn. And most of them, the vast majority of the species, return to their natal waters to spawn. During the colonial period, everybody knew what these were, okay? This was the original Dorito, okay? You got these things in the spring, you salted them, you smoked them, you put them up as protein for the long, cold, hard winter. You knew it was coming. They went into your garden, they fed your corn patch, they fed your squash, they fed your kids, you know, that was critical, you know? And then the Industrial Revolution comes along and literally in an eye blank, it all disappeared. The numbers of our native species are much, much lower than they were historically. And that's because of the large numbers of, of dams in our rivers, which block fish, make it, um, in many cases, completely impossible for fish to get back to their native habitat. So when we look at the species as a whole, historically, it's been reduced in its population 96 to 97 percent. Once people start to understand the connection and that that bit about being a keystone species and they start seeing more bald eagles and they start seeing more loons and they start seeing more osprey and great blue herons and all the other things connected to every belted kingfisher. When you look at the number of different species that consume river herring across the board, both in the freshwater and the marine environment, you start to get a pretty good understanding of how complex and how critical this species is to a healthy and diverse ecosystem. The city and our community has really embraced the alewife and it has been just a delight to have people say, when is fish passage going to happen? I'm a firm believer that science has to be a hands-on event. And my friend Tina asked if we would like to be involved in Upstream and the Elwives collection. So every year I take all of my classes down to the dam and we are gathering data for what we hope to be 10 years of data that it, at some point will allow us to harvest Elwives in the town of Gardner. We looked for the fish in this specific spot because of the dam. 
So the dam hinders any progress of them for any for moving potentially upstream. And so any given day that you come here, there's between uh, 100,000 and 500,000 fish that are there really trying their hardest to get back up to the place that they were born. For creatures like alewives, their numbers will begin to rebound as soon as fish are able to make their way upstream to, to reproduce. When you talk about fish passage, you talk about changes to an ecosystem that are, for the most part, excellent simply because these are fish that belong here. These are fish that were designed to be in these waters. One reason why so many people are enthusiastic about this is because the watershed has so much potential. The Department of Marine Resources estimates that full access could bring more than 3 million adult alewives uh, up from the ocean into the system each year. Currently, our goal is to get up past the lower three dams into the Pleasant Pond and Cobbesy Stream portion of the watershed. We're really fortunate because river herring, which is the species that we really want to restore here, are really good at using well-designed fish passages. And we also have to have fish passages for American eel because everything that we find in science indicates that the American eel export a significant amount of nutrients that we do not want in the lakes today. no purpose and no fish passage is a loss. It's a, it's a loss for the local communities. It's a loss for wildlife. And it's a loss uh, truly for the Gulf of Maine. You know, everything in the marine environment, if it can get its mouth around one, you know, bluefin tuna, whales, uh, you know, uh, bluefish, striped bass, halibut, cod, haddock, they all eat them. These fish are highly in demand. Lobstermen need them for lobster bait. Uh, the Asian community needs them for fish sauce. And Canada wants as many as they can get. They're actually canning American alewife and using it for food aid in the Caribbean. Once you've established a run, you're going to have a lot of fish coming back, perhaps more than you want to have in the watershed. And that's when you establish a commercial harvest and create a revenue stream for the municipalities. There's a lot of discussion here about concerns about too many fish. The state of Maine has spectacular success with restoration efforts. We are able to do projects that truly cannot be even imagined in other states. We have been able to bring back millions and millions of alewives that support just an incredible number of birds and other fish. And throughout each of these projects in Maine, there have been questions of every kind from engineers, from scientists, but people have come together. And for these types of technical questions, there are always answers. Show me the one water body that is tanked because we've performed restoration on it. And you're not gonna find it. to the story of the alewife and 
hope that you will be part of the solution and be a voice for the little fish. away in Northern California lies a true bucket list hike, a trail that hugs a 25 okay, my zoom mile is covering where that is, so pardon me for one moment. Ocean vistas. Okay, there we go. So thank you everyone for joining us tonight. Tina Wood from Upstream, who was featured in the video, is here with us tonight, and she will tell us more about her wonderful work on Pavasakanti Street in, in Gardner. So I will share our slides so that she can get started with you. I think the we still have the recording in the background. So, or maybe that's someone yeah. not on mute. Yep, so I just want to remind all the participants to please put your speaker microphone on mute because we can hear background noise. Oh, so there we go. Can, yep, thank you so much. And Tina Wood. Okay, I hope you enjoyed um, the film. It was fun to make um, and to show to groups of people. Um, when we first started seven years ago, um, there's a lot of people really interested in making fish passage happen on Cobbacy Stream. Um, there's a great love for this watershed and stream. Um, and so I work with a really dynamic, vibrant group of about a dozen people um, and our, our first question um, was how can we help educate the people in our communities about this blockage for migration um, so we can show the next slide um, Cobbacy Stream, uh, rich in history. This is a photo from the 1800s of a sturgeon on the bank. Um, Cobbacy Conti is an Abenaki word that means place of many sturgeon. It's always been before the dams a vital um, stream. Um, a healthy stream. Uh, we wanted to get back to that. Um, with the removal of Edwards Dam in Augusta, the sturgeon have come back and really coming to Gardner, um, people come and come to the waterfront to watch the sturgeon jump, which is magnificent to see. Um, so we have the history and we have this beautiful ecological uh, stream. We can see the next slide. Um, this is, you know, just walking up the stream there, you see this was an old um, part of a mill and a bridge over the stream. It's all grown in wild now. Um, there's no operating factories. Uh, there were, uh, I think it was close to 45 different sawmills, broom handle factories um, on the stream. 
and now it's returning to wild. So we're thinking about how can we help that? Um, and as you walk along the banks, you find, you know, old water wheels and remnants of the dam, the dams in the factories. So how do we capture the minds and imaginations of our communities to care for this beautiful resource to restore fish passage? Um, we thought of how to make the hidden visible. You can't really see what's happening under the surface of the water. Um, we wanted to make that visible all year long. Uh, in May, you can walk down and you can see um, some of the fish struggling to get over the dam, but we wanted it to be visible for more than a couple of weeks in the year to keep it in people's minds. Um, so we turned to art. Um, this is the upstream team um, during the COVID year when students weren't in school. Um, we did the data collection um, for a harvest. Um, so how do we educate our community in the value of a restored fishery? What's the best way to reach them? Oh, and the power of migration. I think people were really struck by the thousands of alewives coming up our stream. Um, we really tried to connect, you know, the birds are migrating through. We did migration walks where you could see the migrating birds, which was a hot spot in Kennebec County, um, along with the fish migrating. And people really resonate with that. There's something about finding home uh, in our being. Um, that is powerful. So we really wanted to connect with that idea too. So we turned to art and we turned to science. Um, we used the alewife as an inspiration. Uh, we knew alewives work together and swim together to protect each other. They surge together to get um, over obstacles. Um, there's power in working together and we kind of wanted to bring that uh, to our communities. Hey, together, yeah, this is a difficult problem to solve, but together we can do it. So we used the alewife as inspiration. And we uh, went to uh, nursing homes, we went to schools, festivals, farmer market, um, we hosted workshops, um, lecture series, we had a community art exhibit where, which was so fun, we, I think it's the next slide. Um, oh, that is one of them, but we invited people to make art and submit it to our local downtown gallery. And we had an uh, art show uh, during the month of May when the alewives were returning and it really captured people. That's um, one picture from the exhibit. Um, I think the next slide might be, uh, Yep, more art making. Uh, we weren't anticipating how much joy the art making brought to our community. Um, we used these fish to have sculptures downtown and children brought their families to our downtown. Uh, so it made our, our downtown really lively. Um, so it was an unexpected benefit. Um, we did a big program about um, make big wishes uh, for the fishes. 
and we took all the children's and adults art from those um, workshops and made um, banners that we could have outdoor exhibits, which came in so handy during COVID. When we weren't supposed to gather, we had um, I don't, we had five or six different outdoor exhibits and, you know, being outside along the river and seeing children's art um, and their wishes was powerful experience. Here's one of the banners. Um, we tried to we had their wishes, but we also put facts about migration and our wives together. Um, and we did some historical pieces. There's just a lot of fun facts. Um, people commonly in our area ate our wives. Um, and one of the facts we found out is when the refrigerator became important, people no longer ate salted alewives. Um, it dropped out of their food diet. So we included fun facts about the history of alewives. Um, I always like to really celebrate our uh, gardeners wastewater treatment plant. They have worked so hard uh, to get sewage and um, rainwater, stormwater out of the stream and river, um, millions of dollars in upgrades. Um, when we did the listening tent um, during the river festival, many people talked about working in the mills and the bathroom was an open hole to the stream. Um, so, the wastewater treatment plant has really collected a lot of storm water um, and kept sewage out of the stream in the Kennebec River. Oh, and here's the, the listening tent was so fun. Um, we, during uh, our river festival, we collected people's oral stories of what they remembered about Cobbacy Stream. Um, and it was really just delightful uh, to hear the history, uh, the details, um, how people caught salmon that were coming up Cobbacy Stream and put it on their gardens for fertilizer. Um, so it was great to have that connection. We tried something fun. This was our first public um, event after COVID kind of loosened its grip. Um, and we decided, well, one of our themes all along was how do we celebrate our resource? Um, and so we did the Al Wife Review, which was a great way to bring in some facts about Al Wives. We had um, made a game called Fisho, which had different facts and things you needed for fish restoration. Uh, we had an improv artist who um, introduced and ran the show, and we had great music live music that um, they had composed some fish songs and, um, and we had an art project of um, creating a, a fish tapestry. So um, it was an exciting night. Um, we answered questions about our project. Uh, we've been doing a stream cleanup for five years, and this year, I just wanted to move it from just upstream and invite local nonprofits in um, Cobbacy Watershed, 
which is 217 square miles and involves nine towns. Um, but the nonprofits in our area are very connected to their communities. So we had Kennebec Land Trust, um, Gardner Main Street, Boys and Girls Club. Um, it became a United Way event, um, Day of Caring. We had Gardner Thrive, Gardner Rotary, and we ended up having a huge cleanup. And the thing that we noticed was people were really happy to be working together on something that makes a big difference. So 2,100 pounds of trash removed. Um, so it was a big successful event that will keep continuing. Um, so we, we had the art part. The science part was um, we began with the high school doing the data collection. Um, we're in hopes that uh, restored fisheries will have a harvest um, and you need 10 years of data. So, and the high school has been so excited. The kids have been so excited to be doing something that matters. Uh, they're on the stream um, making a difference and now uh, the whole science department um, comes down. I think it's close to a hundred students involved now that um, are working on data collection. I just love this picture because of the throw net towards, um, they collect data for the whole month of May uh, and Towards the end of May, the waters are low. It's harder to capture. They, they're up to now um, doing 200 a day. We started out with 50 a day, so 200 fish. So sometimes we have a permit to use a throw net to capture them. And the throw net is so dramatic because it captures whatever's there. And um, there's been eel and brook trout in with the alewives, um, which is fascinating to see. So here are the students. Um, they mass them, um, measure the length, get a scale sample. Uh, I think that's it, but let's see what the next slide is. Oh yeah, they got to catch them. They like that part. <laughs> yeah, it's really uh, hands-on important work. Okay, so um, we wrote grants. Um, and this was the feasibility study um, by Joe McLean, uh, professional engineer, who came up with three options for two of the dams. Um, the first dam, Garden of Paperboard Dam, which blocks the stream, uh, the first impediment to migration, and the New Mills Dam, which is the third dam. Um, this was about a two year process of meeting with stakeholders, gathering input, listening to concerns so that the plan um, fit the needs of our community. And from those uh, stakeholder meetings, it was clear that Cobbesee Watershed District um, that manages Cobbesee Watershed was concerned about water quality and water levels. So the next link is um, upstream, uh, Richard Baer, uh, scientist, retired scientist with DEP um, and 
um, Dan O'Claire reviewed the public um, literature on water quality. Um, Maine DMR has restored over a hundred uh, lakes and ponds in Maine and DEP has um, water quality information on those lakes and they reviewed, they, they looked at all the data and they picked 21 uh, ponds and lakes with a variety of water quality, some with poor water quality, some um, with average water quality, some with good water quality. And there, they concluded that um, after careful review and analysis of the data, the research demonstrates that with appropriate management, alewife can be restored to Cobbesy watershed without compromising water quality or water levels. This can be done by enabling low to moderate incoming escapement rates of adult fish with surplus adults harvest commercially uh, and by concentrating water flows to support the out migration. So um, after that, the three commissioners um, from DEP, IFNW, and uh, Department of Marine Resources wrote a letter to all the towns in Cobbesy watershed, there's nine, um, where they outlined that while they recognize that there is concerns, they believe with proper planning and management, the goals of maintaining water quality, lake water levels, dam operational flexibility, robust recreational fishing opportunities, and restoring runs of native sea run alewives can and will be met. So where we are right now um, is on DEP and Department of Marine Resources and IFNW and Cobbesy Watershed District are meeting to develop an adaptive management plan that answers um, concerns uh, so we can move forward with fish passage. Uh, this is uh, one of the banners that we use um, and we're hopeful um, because we don't get a second chance plan it. Got fish passage? Not yet, but we're working on it. And our motto is do one small thing for fish passage a day. Thanks for listening. And thank you, Tina, for sharing your knowledge and experiences and leadership with heading up upstream in Gardner. And Tina Wood got to attend our Fresh to Salt Flowing Together Watershed Educator Workshop in June. And our theme this school year is Anadromous Alewives. And Tina contributed some wonderful um, knowledge and support to that workshop as well. And she plans to take some of the activities back to upstream. So just quickly, my name is Alina Zahowski. If you weren't signed on right away in the beginning, I'm an aquatic science educator at Herringut Coastal Science Center. And our new watershed education project is Fresh to Salt Flowing Together. And it's for Maine schools and communities. It brings together middle school students, teachers, and conservation leaders through collaborative experiences within Maine's watersheds. And right now, our teachers and students are mostly in the Kennebec River watershed. And one school is within the Eastern Coastal watershed. And there's already some talk of collaborating between a school from the Eastern Coastal Watershed and the Kennebec Watershed. 
Something unique about this watershed education project is it is aligned with next generation science standards. So it's ready to go in the classroom with all three components. So the grade level concepts, the ways of thinking, and the ways of doing, which are the science and engineering practices. It also includes the five E's, engage, explore, explain, elaborate, and evaluate so that students can have the deepest learning, deepest thinking and application of their skills. And it's done in a very hands-on way. So we had five educators total from the Kennebec and Central Coastal Watersheds or Eastern Coastal rather. We had a hybrid setup. So one of our educators attended virtually and we had some hands-on activities where teachers are practicing what the students would do and smelling what the alewives would smell as they try to navigate towards their natal water bodies where they were born. The educators also got field experience so they can bring the physical kit that they obtained from our workshop out into the field with students to sample the water and test for biotic factors like macroinvertebrates that are present and can tell you what quality of water the water body has. And they can also test chemical parameters with a refractometer, looking at salinity, and they can test temperature, pH, among other factors. So just an example of what one of these lessons looks like if a teacher joins our project. It's set up and it tells you which blue, orange, and green next generation science standards are aligned, gives all of the materials, gives background information, and then goes into the lesson activities with tips on the side and links as well. And all of the materials are present for them in a virtual folder that they can access. If you'd like to learn more about our watershed education project, you can go to freshtosalt.org and you can join our project like Tina did. You can read about 10 watersheds within Maine. And there's a page where students and people in the community, if you're part of the project, can enter data for different projects. And then you'll get a login from us if you attend so that you can input your data onto a spreadsheet. Are there any questions for Tina? I'll stop the share here. So feel free to unmute yourself and ask Tina a question about upstream or about her presentation. I have a question for you, Tina. So how can community members get involved and help you with your good work on Cabasa County stream? Okay. I, and I just want to say the Fresh to Salt program was so well done and valuable. And just what's needed right now, um, the information uh, was powerful and uh, really well organized. So thank you for that um, so the best way to get involved is to learn more about uh, migrating fish in your area or if you live in mine it would be great if you uh, came to one of our board meetings which is the first tuesday of the month um, and you can email me uh, to get more information about that. We really need more hands-on people uh, to help with our, uh, we, we all <laughs> in our group have these great ideas that we're sure it's gonna further us along. Um, so we could use more people. Um, and also join us at the cleanup 
It's a great way to connect with your community. Um, and we do that on Earth Day. Um, so it's the, usually the third Saturday in April. Um, I encourage you to go out and sit by a stream or river, take notes, see what's happening. Right now, millions and millions of juvenile alwives are exiting and flowing into Mary Meeting Bay. Uh, each morning I swim in Mary Meeting Bay and uh, <laughs> the bay is hopping with uh, fish and birds. Uh, it's powerful to see something so alive and be part of it. So I encourage you to get out. Uh, let's see. Um, check out uh, World Fish Migration Day. That usually happens on uh, even number years uh, in May. They have great resources and a lot you can learn a lot about migration and it's really cool to be something that's happening worldwide. Um, exciting. I also think volunteering for our local nonprofits, um, the land trusts are important. Um, they help take care of our watersheds. Oh, and if you love to write, um, write something to the newspaper. Um, let your voice tell the story of the alwife. Uh, if you live in Cobbacy Watershed, go to your council meeting and say, why isn't this happening? What can we do to make this unfold? Um, that would be wonderful. Um, so those are some of the ways. We have this great little worksheet, 10 ways to help the little fish home. And we also have, I encourage you, if you're living in Maine, um, the Maine Alwife Trail Map, um, there's a dozen places to visit um, and learn about alwives during the migration run. Really powerful. I got to see the migration run of the alewives for the first time in person in May, and oh. it was incredible. It, it's very moving just to see that many fish, because I could read about it and plan lessons about it, but to actually go and see it for myself was just astounding, really. It was incredible to see that strength in numbers. Yeah. And Tina, if people don't live in Maine and they live elsewhere, in a different watershed by their home, uh, how much of this can they apply in their local watershed? Yeah, I would check out, go, really, we wanna get people down to the water. What is happening there? What can you do to make your watershed more healthy and vital? Um, it can really make a difference for your community. So check out, Go down, take a look, um, and find out uh, what organizations are working in your area. Good advice. Something that stood out to me uh, in part of the video is that, or in part of your presentation, was Maine stocked the lower portion of the Cabasa County stream for about 20 years. Yes. So do they have to keep restocking with fish because the alewives can't make it up to their spawning grounds? Yes. Yeah. Okay. And they, they stock, it varies a bit every year, but about 10,000 fish. Um, so that um, compounds. So there's like uh, 100,000 fish returning um to the gardener paperboard dam wanting to get back home that is very many fish and i'm so glad that you've been working successfully in bringing people together to take steps towards opening that passage for those alewives thank you
And I'm glad you brought up World Fish Migration Day. And it sounds like the Cabas de Conti watershed is pretty large with nine towns fitting yes. out that. Yeah. And that's part of the Kennebec watershed? Yes, Kennebec River. Okay. Yeah. And I also wanted to add that I attended the Alewife review. So if you get a chance to go to an upstream event, please go. It was definitely very much fun and yeah. quite a variety of activities and entertainment, as well as a solid portion with excellent discussion among community members and just really asking a lot of questions to understand and people with background information about more experience with Alewives or other government organizations, state organizations, and nonprofits that were coming together to be part of the discussion. And it was really great. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I would say celebrate what you have. Uh, it's a way to bring people together. Um, and a lot can happen and get accomplished if you think of any community problem that needs a solution. Well said. <laughs> and does anyone have any questions at this point for Tina or for me about fresh to salt flowing together, watershed education? Would anybody like links? Tina, is that something we could do is share the links to the water quality report? Uh, and let's see, can I get that? Because I could put that into the chat. Okay. Let's see. So let me do that. I can pull them from oh, the okay. show and put them there. All right, that's good. Okay, so let's see if that works. Okay, they're just all in a row. So all three of those documents are in the chat. They're not live links, but if you copy them and put them in your browser, they should go to that document. They, Tina, they might need to request permission to view that from you, but if they click request. Yeah, I think, Oh. Um, they are on public. Uh, okay. If you have the link, you can look at them, but I can fix that if not. Yeah, I think it's just going to a Google page for me with this particular link from the slideshow. Okay. But if anybody would like that information, you can also email me. I will put my email in the chat. Okay, so azahowski at herringgut.org. You are welcome to email me if you would like to request to see those reports, or if you would also like a link to the main Alewife trail map, I can get you connected to those if you're not able to find those as well. Oh, and it looks like Herring Gut will be able to just share those out in an email tomorrow to everyone oh. who attended tonight. Great. Thank you, Sally, for that. And at this point, I'll close our session. So thank you very much to our speaker, Tina Wood, for spending time with us and sharing her experience working towards opening migratory fish passage in the Kennebec River watershed. Thank you everyone for joining us and sharing an interest in watershed health and anadromous alewives. We appreciate your support and hope to see you next month. Next month's Learn, Discover, Grow event will be on Tuesday, October 25th at 7 p.m. The event will be Watershed Series Part Two, Your Dog's Poo in the Big Blue. Yes, <laughs> Part Two on Number Two. Here <laughs> We will hear about how waste left on the land from dogs flows into the St. George River during periods of rain. 
This can affect water quality of the river and impact clamors, aquaculture, and recreation. It's a current issue that was discussed a couple of weeks ago at the Regional Shellfish Committee meeting. And we'll have three speakers, David Taylor, a lobsterman and clamor, and the chair of the Shellfish Committee, Bryant Lewis, Western Maine Shellfish Growing Area Program Supervisor, and Matt Bonner, the Georges, from the Georges River Land Trust. Thank you again to all in attendance this evening. I hope you have a wonderful night and see you next month. Bye everybody. Thank you. Thank you again, Tina.